I am Officer Peter Gordon, and I'm going to be recalling the length of my encounters with the cult of the Spring Stag. As I proceed, it should be noted that I do not believe in the supernatural, or dark magic, or any of that nonsense. Any references that might suggest my belief in the supernatural, I assure you, is just my complete, unaltered recollection of what I witnessed and experienced. 2001. The new century. I thought I was going to get something new. Well, I did, but it was nothing good. By then, I'd been a lawman off the town of Yellow Ridge for about 20-odd years. And odd they were. My daddy was a lawman. He was the reason I got into it at just the age of 16. Unofficially, of course. It was only when I became 18 years old that I was considered legally a man of justice. Yellow Ridge, you see, is just the perfect size. The town's big enough where you could just move on in and have no hassle about it. But if you were a people person, there were certainly people to see. In my first two unofficial years of service, I'd learned pretty much all there was to know about the job. I was setting up to be not just any lawman, but a sheriff or deputy or something. According to my daddy, anyways. It's ironic, now that I recall it. The guys at the station used to call me the stag, on account of my age and, well, lack of a woman, I suppose, despite my clinging on to hopes with... Elizabeth. By the time I was officially welcomed into the service of the law, I knew just about every face and name around the town, save for a fair amount of passers-by and temporary residents in the motel. But even then, some of those folks still managed to cause enough of a stir before they left on their way again. I can remember once this big, buff-looking fella. He was some biker gang bastard. He was passing on through and made some trouble with some girl in that motel. We went and we sorted it out, only didn't he go and do it again with another. And another. That whiskey bar was always too damn close to that motel. Just made it easy for f scum like that to buy a few rounds for a lady and then have his way before the night's out. We did get a fourth report concerning him, though. At first it was such and such about some guy down at the motel, but my daddy was good. He knew. He said to one of the boys, If I go down there and it's that goddamn biker again, which I know it is, I'ma have to kill him. I tried to stop my daddy, but we were already out to the door and, well, we were basically at the car by then. You see, my daddy was no gunslinger by any means, so if he felt something was off, if he thought guns or weapons were necessary, everyone took that seriously. So, he and I drove down to the motel and, on the way, I'm really asking him if he wants to kill this man. My daddy had this look, the shine on the glassy whites of his eyes just looks different. He's dead focused on the road, all while I'm reminding him that there's no going back once he kills a man. Not a lesson that I knew from experience, no. That was a lesson he taught me. Anyways, in we roll, and there he is, big silhouette in the doorway to the room. The girl is walking towards us and is halfway down the parking lot already. You see, he'd let her go when he heard us coming, so we technically couldn't catch him with her. So, Daddy lets her sit and wait in the car, and he doesn't even ask her a single question on what happened or what did he do. He just starts walking right up to her. You are certainly fixing to die, my Daddy says to him, standing eye level with the yellow teeth of his ugly grin. I do not care what I did or did not see. I know what I know. My Daddy starts to ramble on, near about to burst when the huge biker leans forward, taunting, Prove it. The smell of smoke, coffee, and whiskey fumed out of his breath and go from both my nostrils, even as I was beside and slightly behind my daddy. Oh, my daddy did not like that. I heard the strain of leather as he gripped the gun in his holster. My first instinct is to call him out and put my hand over his so he can't draw his weapon and do something he might regret. No, come on now, I plead with him. We can have a word with the bartender, we can have him banned... Whatever, whatever. He wasn't convinced yet. You better listen to your boy, says the biker. And although my daddy had a seething hatred for this man, 
it seems that he suddenly took it to heart. He realised that I was being the rational one, making a good call about speaking to the bartender and also reminding him that I was his boy. His fatherly instincts must have just won over. I don't know. His gut feeling to put the bastard down was somehow subsided. So help me God, my daddy warns through his teeth. But we leave him. We get back to the car and we just get the girl back into the town proper. She's telling us how apparently this is the last night that biker fella is staying here. He just wanted to have a memorable night in Sweet Yellow Ridge. But she was right. No more reports after that. Nobody had seen him, and after the passing of a few days, my daddy commends me for keeping a level head about me, especially dealing with a scumbag like that. Then, moments later, like fate was playing some cruel joke, the station TV is showing us the man's picture and a list of new crimes and victims he found himself down in California. Was he right, my daddy? Should he have shot and killed that man right there in that motel that night? I don't know, but that was when he started to teach me how to drive. He was reminded that you need to be prepared for anything, and knowing how to drive is certainly good preparation. All those late summer days, the sunsets lighting up the roads for me to practice driving on. Yellow Ridge wasn't exactly a crime-ridden town, and wasn't so bizarre as it would come to be later on, so I wasn't driving my daddy and I around on any missions except driving to get groceries or getting to the station and back home again. But getting to drive down to the diner by myself whenever I wanted was a nice thing. The food was good, but Elizabeth was always working. It seemed that whenever she was serving me, I suddenly got a spare dollar change in my pocket to leave an extra tip. At the same time, it seemed she always had an extra smile to go with my food. That is, when her man wasn't around. I wasn't really sure what he was, but I had come to know that they were entangled since their school years. I got to know Lizzie outside of work, and the more time we spent together, I knew exactly before too long what my feelings were. It just wasn't meant to be, though. Although I loved her and she loved me too, it was complicated with her family and that fella's career or something along those lines. Just one kiss is what we shared before she was gone. I never understood it, getting married along at an age like that. I know for certain I still felt the glimmer of childhood within me, and I was the one who had a gun at work. But she was the one for me. Luckily, they didn't move too far away, and every now and then, once or twice a year, she would come back into town shortly to visit her parents, still living in Yellow Ridge. It wasn't often for me to see her, so I cherished our rare meetings over the years, whether it be passing each other in the grocery store randomly, or somewhere along the road, or even back at that same diner. It wasn't very long until, on one of her visits, she appeared to be a few months pregnant, and... Soon after that, on her next visit, there was her daughter, right next to her. But fate still had its cruel games. By some time into the 90s, Yellow Ridge had began getting a whole lot stranger. Crimes of bizarre details and the most unusual happenings started to crop up. It took about two years for me to accept that Lizzie had stopped visiting her parents, likely having moved further away, and on top of that, my daddy wasn't around no more either. I suffered a long few years dealing with, mostly, drug-addicted maniacs, vandalizing places, running around with barely any clothes on, even breaking into people's homes, and worse. Sure, I got closer to the rest of the officers at the station, but at the same time, it still felt lonely. It's like a paradox, or would you call it ironic? I don't know. It was lonely, but I preferred to do my job alone. Uh, I guess that's just the repercussions of being broken into the job with my own daddy being my partner. But working alone gives me the freedom of free choice, 
Like, for instance, being able to stop and chat with some townspeople. Like, notably, Elizabeth's parents. They once called in about some crazy guy digging in front yards around some of the houses. As to be expected, he was coked up and also on some amphetamines. The biggest surprise to me that day wasn't the maniac digging holes. It was Elizabeth's parents remembering exactly who I was, and recalling what there was between me and Lizzie. Of course, the situation did call for her parents to be on board with whatever the hell was going on, but they knew. It wasn't long before I could just stop by their home and chat away with them like they were parents of my own. Over time, it seemed like they were finding ways to bring up the connection between me and Lizzie, like they were spurring me on or something. But that's because they knew Lizzie was coming back. Long divorced and trying to find her way as a single mother, Lizzie sent word back to her parents in Yellowbridge that she needed help. She was coming home. They certainly thought the stars were aligning. And I did too. But... I think that's all there is to say about my history with Yellow Ridge and Lizzie leading up to the particular matter at hand, the Spring Stag, and unfortunately both Yellow Ridge and Lizzie are integral to this tragedy. So finally reconnected and rekindled, Lizzie was back in my life, and she brought with her the Harbinger, her daughter Gemma. The passing time had me completely illusioned. I could always imagine Lizzie out there somewhere with a child by her side, but in reality, Gemma was around 19 years old when Lizzie came back into Yellow Ridge. At first, the two of them were moving into Lizzie's parents' place, but they were sort of living on pension, very quiet-like and low-profile. Let's just say it didn't last very long, at least since I had something to say about it. All the commotion proved to be overwhelming for Lizzie's parents, and at the same time, I was living alone and had plenty of spare room to accommodate Lizzie and Gemma. The house had grown somewhat cold after my mother and eventually my daddy left it all behind just to me. So it was like some kind of jumpstarter family, breathing whole new life into my home, or our home as it were. I liked to keep things relatively tidy, but Gemma, she was not so caring, always leaving her shoes around the front door to trip over. But I couldn't blame her. She was brought around the country, trying to find the best place to settle down, only for Lizzie's bad luck with work and available areas being downright unforgiving. I suppose that's not to say she was exactly not a caring person, but just reckless. She had no guide, no proper way as a young girl. By this point, though, she was about old enough to not accept much of any guidance from me, acting as some kind of de facto stepdaddy. No, Gemma, she received her guidance elsewhere, from someone who made her feel safe and welcomed and special. Someone as charming and silver-tongued as the devil on Halloween night. Terence Hart, blonde hair, the colour of pineapple, eyes that hooked you like a fish, jawline that could cook glass. I never knew where he came from or where he lived even. As far as I knew, he didn't live in Yellow Ridge, or he somehow lived there under my nose for all 23 years of his life. He had his fingers under the skin of many, including Gemma, but I wouldn't know any of that yet. Lizzie and I had spoken on a few occasions about Gemma, and what she does and how she is. She spoke to me so little that I had to get to know her through her mother. I knew that having Gemma around would be a challenge, but there's no way I could have, nor would have, separated Lizzie from her own daughter. I had known too well the pain of separating with loved ones. However, Gemma was seeing a doctor regularly to help her with mental troubles, like a psychiatrist or therapist or something. I'd never met them, though. I volunteered to drive her to each appointment myself. This was one of the few ways I could attempt to speak with her. 
Even then, the drives always came down mostly to small talk. I guess she was saving anything remotely heavy for when she was speaking to her doctor. After Lizzie and Gemma had been living with me for a few weeks, there was beginning to be an uptake of roadkill. Now, forestry lining most of the sides of the main road passing through Yellow Ridge, roadkill wasn't really a big deal. But when I say an uptick, I mean it. As you drove that road, you'd be passing another splattered and flattened animal every ten seconds. I thought just another one of the many anomalies that struck Yellow Ridge. That was until they started getting careless with it. Animal carcasses were being found before any vehicle had a chance to run them over yet. Some had their heads removed, some their tails, some gutted, one of them was even completely skinned. Makes you wonder if they wanted to blow their cover. The people of Yellow Ridge, even some inside the station, started to joke about some kind of lunatic on the loose who had a vendetta against squirrels and muskrats. The terrifying animal lector. Yeah, I never found it too funny at the time. And certainly, nobody would find it funny later on. Now, Gemma never spoke a word of that joke or laughed any time it came up, but she did hide a small giggle, though, when we would pass actual roadkill itself on the road. I knew that she found something inherently funny about it, but she always did her best to hide it since she discovered early on that I was passionate about wild animals and nature and such. I was just saying to myself, at least she's already seeing a doctor, because I don't think Lizzie would like me calling Gemma a psycho. I did speak to Lizzie about it though, wondering if it's just something that's always been about her, but she told me that Gemma always loved dogs and wanted to have a dog friend of her own, as far back as she remembers with Gemma. But... Since moving back to Yellow Ridge, she's been quiet about wanting a dog, and when Lizzie brought it up to her that they may be able to get one since they were finally living in one place, she denied it. She entirely lost interest in loving animals. I just thought that was unfortunate because it could have at least been a common point of conversation between us, but that was changed by her new friends. That boy, Terence Hart, that cult... That wasn't actually Gemma's first connection in Yellow Ridge. There was a hall near the middle of town where it was used as a youth gathering kind of place. There she met her first friend, Jocelyn. She was a quiet kid, the shy type that wouldn't speak much outside of her friends, but she'd definitely be loyal. It's a sad thing. She uh, went missing not so long after Lizzie and Gemma settled in, around the same time that Gemma likely befriended Terence. I still suspect it was Jocelyn's disappearance that introduced Gemma and Terence, but in reality, the truth about how and when their paths converged is unclear. Now, of course, being a Yellow Ridge police officer, I was soon amidst the investigations trying to find Jocelyn's whereabouts. I even questioned Gemma in one of our car trips. Uh, your friend, Jocelyn, she didn't say anything about running away or nothing, did she? Uh, Gemma just continues looking out the window and asks all snarky if she's under investigation. So I say, no, no, you aren't under investigation. I'm just trying to find where your friend is. Her parents are getting mighty worried. I don't know, she says back to me, still with the attitude, so I'm telling her, what would your mother feel like if you disappeared one day? And doesn't she just flip it sideways by finally turning her head to me and saying, You tell me, officer, what does my mother feel like? Well, I'm afraid to say I just dropped it there and then. Later that day, though, there was a small lead we got from someone who claims they saw Jocelyn on the day of her disappearance. They said they saw her walking on the side of the road near the edge of town, heading in the direction out of Yellow Ridge. Now mind you, there's nothing out there except for farmland some ways down past the forestry. So, with the sun almost down, I sat out in the cruiser and I took a slow drive down the road to see if there was anything off that I could find. Meanwhile, we had other officers searching all around into the trees. 
As I imagined, there was no clear evidence of anything by the side of the road. Not for a while, but that was until I got near the fields. A single shoe. One from a pair of white sneakers. So I parked up the car and went out with the flashlight. I saw up ahead there was some trampled grass. I followed along the shaky trail until I tripped over a rock. It was stained with blood. It must have been used as a blunt force weapon. I hoped it was Jocelyn fighting off her attacker, but the strewn about clothes didn't help morale. Low on optimism, I moved forward into somewhat of a clearing between the trees and the field I stood in, and with the sun then being beyond the horizon, casting more cold darkness, my attention was caught by the glimmer of a tiny distant light. Immediately unsure of what exactly it was that caught my attention, I flicked my flashlight up towards it into the distant dark veil of the trees. I was just about able to see the waving light, but to make sure, I moved my flashlight back down to see I was correct. The tiny orange ember shimmering between the trees was calling me. So, as I moved towards it, I returned my flashlight to shine ahead. As I approached closer and closer with my flashlight trained on the glimmer and illuminating the area around it, the flame in a rush went out, then followed by screams. The screams of Jocelyn. I broke into a sprint. The grass made me slow, but I still remembered exactly where I saw that small flame. As I got close enough to break past the trees, I heard choked gasps of air. I emerged into a small open ring amongst the trees, and the warmth emanating from Jocelyn's innards hit my skin. Tied up against two trees, Jocelyn hung nakedly by her hands and feet, her guts still freshly pouring out. I heard the frantic snapping of twigs and branches from obviously multiple people fleeing the scene, I froze. Jocelyn, even as she still gasped for life, of course, would not survive her injuries after just another minute. She could not be saved, and even though I knew she was fading away without any way to stop it, I couldn't leave her. I think if I'd just kept running and chasing after at least one of the suspects, I could have caught them. I don't know. They got away. I didn't even help the girl, I just I didn't know what to do. I, I looked into her eyes as she hung above me, and slowly her life was drained. The sound of tumbling through the trees grew more distant before it reached a point of getting louder again. It was three officers we had in the forest running over to investigate the scream. They barged in with flashlights hitting my face and the body, then hearing frightened gasps from each of them. My stunned face would have told them everything if the body itself wasn't hanging right in front of us. I had to snap out of my shock. I just started ordering them around, reminding myself that the longer we do nothing, the better chance the suspects have of getting away. So in a panic, I barked out a few orders, had a pair of officers trying to chase them down, and before you know it, the sun's back up, we have an investigation underway, and no one was caught. However, we did soon find something that could have been our hint of a calling card. It was a pair of antlers forced into the girl's head. Their jagged shape in the dark had me thinking they were just some branches from the trees. There was also a purple candlestick at the scene which we could assume held that small ember that I saw. I went out to the nearest house and talked to the older man living there, who also happened to own the very field which bordered on the forest. The borderline I walked along to discover the crime. He said he thought he heard the screaming, but didn't hear or see much of anything else beside that. At around 3pm that day, I was told to go home and rest since I hadn't been to sleep, so I went, but I wasn't getting any sleep after what I'd seen that night. I did have short moments of sleep though, and each time I did, I dreamt up a vision, replicating the scene. I'd pick up the purple candlestick, and as I did, 
the wick would come alight all by itself. As the light came out, I'd see someone digging a knife through and across the belly of the girl. I had no ability to move and stop them. I'd lift the candle up, and in front and above, I'd stare at that girl, the antlers protruding from her head, seeming to slowly grow and grow, becoming more of a silhouette as it did. And I'd just stare into her eyes, two perfectly round, gleaming white lights. It was the 28th of March, although we of course didn't know it, it was just three days until the cult would celebrate the spring stag. From that night onwards, we were on high alert. The crime was just too obscene and the methods of torture and killing were too orchestrated. We could have well been witnessing the start of a pattern, so we were doing our best to ensure that no such pattern could emerge. Now, with the severity of this crime, it wasn't long before most people in Yellow Ridge got paranoid. Sure, there were strange crimes cropping up around the 90s, but nothing quite like this. We purposely didn't make all the gruesome details fully public in order to not cause paranoia in Yellow Ridge. But, in a town like that, word can spread fast. Even then... I can't say I wasn't immediately among the paranoid population, notably standing out later that evening after I woke up from the little sleep I did get. I grabbed myself a glass of water and went over to turn the TV on when I saw from the corner of my eye Gemma's shoes at the front door as always, but more so than usual they were mucky and filthy. It's as if she was running through the trees. Right then, I had to make myself decide if I was going to give in and start chasing the leads of my own paranoia, or if I was going to try to remain as rational as possible. I thought back to my daddy, and what the hell would he have done in that situation? Well, I looked over to the mounted stag's head over the TV thinking of him, but my dreams were still swirling around somewhere in my mind. I swear I could just about hear a very faint, deep, guttural hum emanating from it the longer I stared it down, until I just had to look away. But I was sure my daddy would have appreciated and commended me on my rationality. So, the dirty shoes just lay there, looking guilty as sin, while Gemma slept away in her own bedroom down the hall. On top of that, I somehow didn't piece it together at the time, but why was Gemma sleeping at a time like I was, in the late afternoon? Maybe it was me forcing myself to be rational that stopped my brain from piecing that together as possible evidence. However, while it has long since passed and it cannot be specifically proven for that crime, I am certain that Gemma was one of the fleeing suspects of Jocelyn's murder. I went back to sleep until the morning of the next day, but this time I went out like a brick, didn't even hear Lizzie come home or get into bed. But I awoke on the morning of the 29th and went out to see Lizzie making up some breakfast already. She commented on me being gone, then followed by sleeping like a log, so I told her a bit about what I'd seen. She thought I should take a day of rest, but there was no way I was going to hinder Yellow Ridge's defense in order for me to get even more rest. In hindsight, I should have taken more rest had I known the events that would soon transpire. Lizzie opened up the cabinet and she asked me where all the plates had gone. I was confused, so I checked it myself and found that, indeed, all of my plates were missing. Surely nobody would have broken in during the night to steal plates, right? Well, Yellow Ridge's recent crimes at the time actually made me believe that someone might really do that. But I couldn't pay too much mind to it, I was too busy at the time, so we made do with bowls for breakfast. Lizzie soon went to go see her parents and I got ready to head to the station, but right at the front door I was stopped. The vibrating hum came back. With my hand still placed on the doorknob, I looked back to the stag's head. 
As my vision glanced, I swear I was seeing a black silhouetted figure with white eyes. As it came into my view, my heart skipped a beat and my hair began standing on end. But when I had fully turned and was facing directly towards it, there was nothing. Just daddy's old stag head. It's antlers no more intimidating than the day you put it up. The rest of the day was quite busy, with investigations about the murder still ongoing. Cannot begin to imagine what Jocelyn's parents must have been going through. Having your only child murdered like that, being the very instigation of everyone else's fear and paranoia. I don't think they ever truly recovered from that loss. By the end of my working day on the 29th, I went home to find Lizzie and Gemma mid-conversation as I walked in. Gemma, following my presence, immediately goes more silent. Lizzie then says, well, how about Peter takes you? Not knowing that Gemma was just asking her mother to give her a ride over to some party she was going to. Now, where am I taking you? I ask her, but she just turns to Lizzie and says, see, even he doesn't want to. But trusting Lizzie on whatever I walked in on, and also not giving in to Gemma's attitude, I respond to her. I never said no. I'm just asking where so I can get you on your way. Gemma then begrudgingly says, fine, let's go, brushing past me towards the door. Not that Gemma's attitude was exactly anything new, but I looked over to Lizzie and she just sort of shrugged it away with dreary eyes. She told me it was just some boy named Terence that she knew from the youth hall. Ah, uh, boy stuff, I thought. I didn't argue. I was just hoping for a calm night with Gemma gone, and maybe Lizzie and I would be able to relax and watch a movie or something. So, I quickly drank up some water and went out to the car. The house we were headed to was apparently just outside of town, so I drove and waited for her to give me the call on where I was supposed to turn. In the meantime, it was like I had some kind of minor PTSD from my dreams. As we drove along the dark roads, every now and then I'd see those white eyes for a split second staring out from the trees. I managed to keep myself in line, but the visions affected me, so I mathed up my curiosity. Your shoes there, they uh, seem quite dirty. You were jumping around in mud. As to be expected, completely uninterested in what I had to say, Gemma just says, yep. The white eyes became more frequent, forcing me to remember the gory scene in the forest. I say to her, I'm not so sure how safe it is right now, as we moved past all the daunting trees along the shadowy road. Gemma retorts, I'm glad you've got so much concern for me after you've already driven me to the house. As she says it, she lifts her finger to point over to the first house past the trees. The house whose field bordered the forest. You sure that's the house? Because I'm pretty sure some old guy lives there. As we get closer, I can see small orange embers atop purple candles, leading up the front door of the house and around the porch. Gemma gets out of the car and starts walking towards the house. I then also manage to see that all the candles are sitting on plates. All of my plates. I'm just thinking, what in God's name is going on? So I leap out from the car and catch up to Gemma and tell her that I don't think it's safe here. The hell is wrong with you, she says, pulling away from me. Then out from the front door of the house emerges the bastard, Terence Hart. He comes out to investigate the small commotion. Ah, oh, Gemma. The night can finally be good to us, he says on his approach. And you must be officer friendly. He reaches for a handshake, and I oblige while questioning. And Terence, right? You must be a relative of the old fellow who owns this place. Ah, come on, officer. Not old, rather experienced. It's not about how many years we've lived, it's about how many years we've put to good use. He's just charming the ears off me. I could notice Gemma looking at Terence like he's a star from the sky. I also couldn't help but notice the strange symbol he has wearing as a necklace. Looks like some jagged ring. Before long, I see three more people, two young girls and a young man, seeming about Gemma's age, fill the doorway and look out, clearly to see where Terence has gone, 
Alright, well, I'll let you go and uh, you all just stay safe now, alright? So, I'm just heading back to the car and Terence chimes, Gemma's safe with us, whilst placing one of those symbol necklaces around her head. The hell? Is that some kind of sideways jab at me? At Lizzie? Whatever. I just got back to the car and turned around to head back home. But as I was taken off, I went real slow as to take one last look at the house where Gemma and Terence disappeared into. It was back. The figure. The lanky black stag stood behind the house in the field, watching me with its white glare as I drove on. While the vision of the stag didn't reoccur for the rest of my returning drive, I knew I could still feel it watching me every foot of distance my car moved. My thought was that when I got home and finally got to spend more time with Lizzie, that I could forget about these stupid visions. But once I got back, Lizzie was soon to bring up a strange state of paranoia she was feeling. Almost even difficulty sleeping. Apparently her parents were getting the same thing as her, but worse. Now I'm trying to reassure Lizzie to make her feel safe. So I'm just saying, Lizzie, if this is about these crimes, I can assure you we're safe. Nothing's happening to us, I'm making sure of it. But she tells me that it isn't exactly the crimes that set her off. Or at least it typically wouldn't have, but she can't help but feel paranoid. A level of paranoia felt across the rest of most of Yellow Ridge residents. A startling effect that would come to fruition the next day. 30th of March. One day to go. I'm rudely awoken by one of the station officers banging down my front door, urgently. I get up in a pace and I see what the hell's going on, and I'm told that point blank Yellow Ridge has gone crazy. The officer that came to get me swore she could hear voices herself, but never brought it up in fear of sounding crazy. The same way I never brought up anything about my visions of the stag. I quickly got into uniform and went into town to find people shouting and arguing with each other. The doors of most establishments were shut, and there was plenty of vandalism. Approaching some of these crazed residents, they all ramble on about trouble at the motel, so I try to calm them and leave the officer there to keep things under control as I went to investigate. Along the street signs and lampposts were these hanging symbols. The same ones of those necklaces I saw the night before. I passed people ripping them down and some people were even burning them on the ground. Yellow Ridge had lost its damn mind. Once I got to the motel, it was just tragic. All the doors to every room were busted open. All the cars of people who must have been staying there were smashed and trashed. And littered around the entire property were more symbols. Stupidly, it was only then when I connected the dots. After too long, I finally realized where I saw those symbols before. So I raced back home to ask Lizzie where Gemma was, but when I got in, Lizzie was hiding. I called out to her and there was no response. I felt a panic starting to come on as her absence was filled by the ominous stare and hum of the stag's head on the wall. But as I walked through the kitchen, Lizzie jumped out and I managed to catch her holding her wrist back from driving a knife into my chest. What the hell are you doing, Lizzie? I yell at her, and upon her realizing eyes, she lets go of the knife. I thought I heard someone sneaking around, she says, but I was quick to blame her growing paranoia after dampening my own hallucinations surrounding the stag. I sat her down at the table and got us both some water. She said that Gemma hadn't come home that night, so I was out of luck on that lead but I decided that maybe I'd find herself at the house in that field just outside of town. So before leaving, I tried to explain that going to town might not be the safest thing for Lizzie, so without amplifying her paranoia, I just implored her to stay put in the house. Then, as per Lizzie's request, I stopped by her parents' house to check on them. They hadn't slept a wink, their TV was on blaring static, and they had already locked up the house. They both seemed very irritable, so in order to minimize their terror, I just made sure they stayed locked in and safe from others that may approach from the town. Passing through town on my way to the field house, the people were louder and more angered, but we had all of our officers out there at the time, so I didn't stop. I just kept going in hopes I'd get to the bottom of that madness. 
Yet again, I found myself passing the trees at dusk coming up to the house. It looked barren inside, but I couldn't be sure, so I went in with my pistol drawn. There wasn't a sound, and not a trace of anyone left. I called out that a police officer was entering and for anyone inside to show themselves, but of course, zero response. After I hooked around for a bit and found the burned out candles pooling wax all over my plates, I found one clue. It was one of those symbols hanging from the handle of the basement door. I picked up the symbol to finally investigate it closely, where it then became clear. The jagged looking ring was supposed to be two antlers coming together at each end. Now, what the hell was it that made them focus on the stag? I cannot tell. The fact I had a taxidermied stag head mounted on the wall of my home was what made it feel even more unnerving. My daddy got that a long time ago, like it was some kind of judgment day that was set in place the day he put it up there. There was an unnatural cold that swept up at me when I opened the basement door. A cold followed by the smell. The stench forced my guard all the way back up. Each crooked and squeaking step I took down those wooden stairs, I prepared myself for the worst. I wasn't even sure what the worst would be, but I was holding my breath. That poor old fella. His name was Francis Beckett, and he was 78 years old. His disemboweled corpse lay on the ground, with real antlers bashed in to fit the crown of his skull and with the affixed grasp of both his dead hands, he held Polaroid pictures of each individual from the cult, including Gemma, kissing his antler-bearing head. The analysis of the pictures after the fact would suggest that Francis survived having the antlers crammed into his skull, indicated by the fact his pained and frightened facial expression was not the same in every photograph. He likely survived long enough to feel the torturous disembowelment the same way that Jocelyn did in that forest. I took no pleasure in seeing any of those photographs, but as I looked at Gemma's, I was overtaken by a profound sense of fear. Just watching this girl, the daughter of my Lizzie, kissing the head of this man like a send-off. Her eyes were just blank. She was like a zombie. Just barely in frame, you can see half the face of some young man expressionless, waiting for his turn to be photographed. And just in the back of the picture, there's Terence, holding one of the candles and looking like he's midway through a sentence. Some ritualistic phrases, no doubt. My fear compounds while I'm in that basement. My vision begins flashing me with the stare of the stag's white eyes. I must have entered some kind of trance-like state. I was in some waking nightmare snapping my head around to catch the stag before it managed to creep up on me over and over. Before I knew what happened, I was in the fields of tall grass with my weapon drawn, keeping my guard up for whenever I heard rustling anywhere around me. But as soon as I came to realize where I was, and the fact the moon had long since risen, I snapped out of it and had to find my way out of the field and back to my car. I trampled over all the grass and waved all the tall strands out of my way, keeping up my momentum so I wouldn't fall. I thought I had snapped out of it, but looking back, I know that I sped up the longer it took me to get out of that field, thinking there was something behind me, convincing myself I heard it chasing me, sprinting like the galloping of a horse. Once I pushed out from the field and ran back to the car, I turned it on, and looked over to the long trail I had made through the fields to get out. I stared at the stag, watching me once again from the field, much, much closer than it ever was before. Half of one of its skinny front legs standing just into the clearing I had made. It stared me down with hate, frustration that I got away, I think. So I stared back with a psychotic spite of my own. But I took off. I picked up my radio, which I only realized then I had left behind in the car the whole time. I spoke into it, hoping for some response, and the officer that picked up on the other end was desperate for help at the station. 
Apparently, they all thought I'd been killed since they've been trying to reach me through the radio for hours at that point. I sped through some parts of town, hearing screams and crashes throughout, and, although I probably should have, I never stopped. I soon made it to the station, but my headlights lit up my approach through the dark, prompting one of the cult members outside to throw a rock through my windshield. A few inches over, and that rock probably would have split my skull open. Immediately slamming my brakes, I dove out of the car. My vehicle, not coming to a complete stop, kept rolling on, illuminating more of the group attacking the station. One of the first things I recognized as I picked myself up from the ground was the body of an officer, laying perpendicular to one of the cars parked crudely along the street. The front wheel sat still, where the officer's head should have been. My mind, putting the bloody mess into reality, awoke some instinct within me. I drew forth my pistol in less than half a second and put three rounds into the chest of a cultist running towards me with a knife. The fatal shots that rang out from my gun forced the other cultists in the group to be more jumpy and start darting around into cover to hide from my effective line of vision. Luckily, this quick change of stance forced them around into positions where the officers trapped inside the station could lay a few effective gunshots into them, finally, leaving just three cultists in the group, all of which knew that they had been beaten. So in their last acts, two of them, behind the cover of the cars, started slashing the tires so that we wouldn't be able to drive the vehicles effectively after we were done with them here at the station. One of them slid out to slice at the tires on the other side of the vehicle, which he managed to do before we could put him down with gunfire. The other one behind cover decided that this was truly the end of the line, screaming out, the stag lives, before slicing through his own wrists and neck with a blade, dying quickly over the car's trunk. The final third cultists, holding a lit piece of wood with cloth wrapped over it and one of those purple candles sticking out, rammed it into the fuel tank of my vehicle which had since rolled to a stop a little further down the road. Doing it out in the open, she left herself vulnerable to my line of sight where I shot her down, but not before the fiery makeshift torch was already jammed into the car's fuel tank firmly. It was too risky to approach and take it out, so we had no choice but to leave it to explode in the street, which only took barely a minute. Meanwhile, I made it up to the station doors where the remaining officers opened up from the inside. My body was still pumping with adrenaline. I paid almost no attention to all the smashed windows and burned out fire sticks from the cult's failed attempts to burn out the officers inside. But I did notice that the officer's body outside was that of Officer Richard Dame. He was close to my daddy. He was in the station before I was. But... All morning had to wait. I was informed of the descent of Yellow Ridge's residence. That group of cultists that were attacking the station were only a small part of them. The rest were scattered all around the town, terrorizing and hunting down the innocent. Heavy backup was called in, but Yellow Ridge was some distance from anywhere of note that could send it. I tried using the station phone to call home to see if Lizzie was safe, but it wouldn't go through. The cultists cut off all electricity in the station. So we armed up and prepared ourselves before I led the charge further into Yellow Ridge on foot. There was a motorcycle left at the station that belonged to Officer Dame. One of the boys took it to scout ahead while the rest of us moved forward into town. Our advance along the main road was accompanied by the sun finally rising once again, marking that the time had come for the cult. March 31st, the day of celebration of the Spring Stag. Reappearing from behind a corner, our scout had come back informing us that there were road blockades set up with furniture and such, so he joined us on foot. Responding to the screams inside the grocery store, we headed inside to find another cultist attacking some residents that took refuge inside. We managed to save them in time before anyone was hurt, but the people inside were frightened beyond belief. They talked about a town-wide ambush that claimed many lives, that there were monuments made up of the corpses that 
by description, sounded the same as Jocelyn and Mr. Beckett's murder scenes. We left an officer behind to watch over those civilians and protect that small stretch of the town. So, just left with two officers, I led us onwards towards the town hall. Then I hear one of the officers start to pray as we walk to the centre littered with bodies, equal amounts of innocence as there were cultists. It was like stumbling right into the apocalypse. Jesus Christ, I hear one of the officers mutter, trembling. Just hold it together, I tell him. We can't let our guards down. Sir, the praying officer calls out, pointing at the hall's entrance, the doors ajar and the light on the inside. We move up in formation, encroaching on the entrance. I'm prepared. I'm ready to face the stag. Terence, that little bastard, if he's in here, I'm ready to put him down like a dog. One sudden movement and I'm letting this trigger go red. Amping myself up, we enter. Our gun barrels pushing in before we do. I'm expecting, almost wanting even, to see the shadowy stag standing inside for us to shoot down in unison. To put an end to this nightmare. Another collection of dead is what greets us. Naked and gored, the cultists' bodies surround Terence. He's just sat cross-legged like meditation. We scan around for more danger, but that's it. There was no stag, no shootout, no fight, no struggle, no burning conclusion. Just a nauseating reality that filled our noses and stared back at us. We get closer and I demand towards him, do not move. In the same breath I say to the other officers, his name's Terence. He's got to be the leader of all of this. The three of us had our guns aimed firmly at Terence, but he just sat there. No pockets to conceal anything, we could just see his open hands resting on his knees. By all means, he posed no threat. But the praying officer knew that I wasn't seeing threats or no threats. He knew I was ready to shoot. He's unarmed, he says slowly while placing his hand down on top of my gun, pushing it down and away from Terence. We have him, sir. The two officers move up with their guns trained on him, and they start to place him under arrest while I'm just watching it happen in front of me. As they detain him, I patrol around, looking at all the dead, recognizing very few as being part of Yellow Ridge's community. I look at all their faces, but... There's no Gemma. I march over to Terence, now in handcuffs, and I push my pistol against his head and yell, Where is Gemma? Complying with his right to remain silent, he says no words, just scoffs at my question. I'm ushered away from pointing my gun at his head, so I holster it and pace back outside and start checking the bodies out there to see if I can identify Gemma. No luck. In my rush, I look towards the first store I see. The furniture store. I run in and find the place ravished and cleared of all chairs, tables, etc. They were all used to form those road blockades. But that, of course, wasn't my concern. I was heading straight towards the phone behind the reception desk. I key in the number to my home phone with haste and count the beats as I wait for the phone to pick up. Every silent moment that passed diminished my hope, until it finally picked up. Lizzie, on the other end, speaks through harsh and panicked breath as she cries over the phone for help. It's breaking in, it's getting in, please, I need help, she cries out in desperation. Help me, Peter, help me. Before I fling the phone away, I just tell her to lock up everything and hide, I'm on the way. I sprint out from the store, leaving the phone hanging on the open line. I think I remember one of the officers calling out to me as they saw me running at full speed down the road, but I just couldn't stop. I thought I could hear Lizzie's voice still talking to me in my head. Our memories together were flashing one by one, her voice in each memory now sounding like it was still over a phone line. My legs and knees are aching, but... My renewed adrenaline flushes it out, 
It feels like I'm on the verge of a heart attack, beating a million times a second. And I finally turn onto my street. My panic hasn't quite subsided as I'm hearing sirens fade in. Finally, the backup we called for. They took their time. The sun was well above the horizon by then. But the sirens wailing somehow pushed a fresh wave of anxiety over me. An anxiety that would haunt me even worse as I reach my driveway and see my front door broken into. I drew my weapon, but all tactics and safety strategies went out the window. I proceed with no caution. All I knew at that moment is that Lizzie was in danger and she needed me. One small pause is all I took right outside my door, breathing like a dog running. Then I engaged. My first foot landing inside my home twisted my vision with a blur. I was almost living in slow motion. My whole skull went hot. The sun and all of its light became dim. My second foot thrown down into the house, tingling with a rush of blood through my own veins. My arms lift up and point my weapon forwards on their own, aiming down my sight at the stag. Its midnight-coloured body stood rigidly, letting me see its side profile, showing off its demented and distorted figure in its entirety. Its head faced down like a bow, but only as to penetrate its branching antlers through Lizzie's neck and chest. Lizzie groaned with a wide open mouth. I can only imagine the feeling, the flood of pain and anguish. I swore I heard Lizzie's voice distorted by the phone signal, retching out, please, please. So I shot. The stag flickered in and out of existence, but finally noticing me, it turned to face my soul with its eyes like two small moons. Then I was hit with my only ever out-of-body experience. I could see, as close as my nose was to my face, the mouth of the stag. An oily darkness, and its concealed white human teeth falling out and sounding like marbles hitting the wooden floor. Then its snout, exhaling a foggy breath like a bull ready to charge, and similarly dragging and dusting one of its front hooves in the ground. It bowed its head again, pointing the antlers at me. And that's where I aimed. My consciousness returning to my own body, I looked down the top of my pistol and directed it at those antlers dripping in Lizzie's blood. And I fired. Unbeknownst to me, that was my final bullet. I tried pulling that trigger many subsequent times, but I only had the one shot. And thankfully, it seemed like I hit the stag's head directly as it recoiled and bellowed out like a howling, dying wolf. It lost its footing and started falling backwards out of the way. Its whole head fell completely detached as its body collapsed and seemingly disappeared. I don't know. All I exactly remember is being right there and holding Lizzie in my arms as she released her dying breath. I sat there still like a statue. The tears just rolled on. I didn't weep, I just sat there. I can't say for how long, but eventually I woke back up in reality. Lizzie's body went cold and a squad of police entered my home with weapons drawn. Aiming down on me and Gemma next to me, reeling in pain from my final bullet lodged in her shoulder. We got brought in and, well, the rest is history. It's all been documented and recorded on numerous police files. Turns out the paranoia that cult instilled into Yellow Ridge was mostly induced from simply a poisoned water supply. The bastards got access to Yellow Ridge's dedicated water filtration system. Whatever they did to it gave people a heightened paranoia, minor insomnia, auditory or visual hallucinations, which means that goddamn stag that haunted me for days on end was nothing. Imagination. As for where they got the pollutant, where the cult even originated from, it's all under investigation. Because Terrans won't talk. I think that son of a bitch was deemed insane, so 
he didn't get no death sentence, but at least he's still locked up somewhere. Beyond that, they uncovered some writings and diary entries, not just from Terence, but from some other cult members too. The cult was celebrating something they called the Spring Stack. Now, looking past all their symbolism and spirituality, essentially all you need to know is the stag demands a sacrifice of uh, those who don't believe. Of course, translating to murdering the sound-minded innocent who don't fall for the manipulation from Terence. But at the culmination of it all, on the very day of the Spring Stag, Suicide was the most commonly found cause of death for cult members discovered in Yellow Ridge. What exactly Terence had convinced them of, we may never know. So at the end of all of it, most of the cultists were dead. Most of them were fatally wounded or already dead from obviously self-inflicted wounds like some mass suicide. But the others were all dead from being shot down by police officers or even civilians in self-defense. The very few remaining are locked up, either awaiting trial or already sentenced to serious time in prison, mostly in psychiatric care. Gemma, well, she's held in a psychiatric wing of a federal prison. The stag's head that once hung in my home is now kept as evidence in a police lockup somewhere, and a picture of it was the favoured image among news channels to report on the whole ordeal. Now, this is usually the part of the story where I should say that I still can't sleep because the stag appears to me at night and haunts me every day and so on and so on, but no, I grieved through the death of Lizzie. I can barely look at her parents. They don't hold a grudge against me, thankfully, but I just feel as though I failed to protect their daughter. But now, it's all just passed on. Except, the only thing that still lingers about the whole affair are the letters I received from Gemma that she writes to me from the prison. I'm honestly not even sure how she's able or allowed to do so, but it's of no real harm, I suppose. She always writes about what's going on and how she's doing and it feels like, truly, I'm just reading letters from a friend. She has stated on the record and mentioned briefly in some of the letters that she genuinely had no self-control while under the indoctrination of that cult. And I have to say, as a man of logic and the law, even having seen the police interviews with her, I actually believe her. But maybe she just has me fooled. I just don't think I can ever find the courage to write back to her. Only she ends the letters the exact same way every single time. Precisely. It's the only part of the letters that ever keep a coherent structure and pattern across every letter. They always read, Stay well and alive, Peter. I don't want you to miss a thing. And it's always followed by a number that gets lower each time. I was puzzled, but... After some investigating, I deciphered what it means. 74, 68, 62, 53. Considering when she's written each letter, she's counting down 48, 44, 39, 30. The days until March 31st. The date marked for the next celebration of the Spring Stack. <laughs>